Thank you for attending our first climate change and your health webinar on extreme heat presented by Credit Valley Conservation. This is the first webinar in our series of three webinars on the issue of climate change and health. Originally, this webinar was planned as an in-person workshop. Although we cannot meet with you in person, we are happy to be able to provide you with this information virtually. My name is Allison Queenu. I'm the Senior Coordinator of our Rural Residential Outreach Program at Credit Valley Conservation. I'll be your host for today's webinar. Shortly, I'll be introducing you to a panel of experts as we explore the issue of climate change, extreme heat, and the impact on health. But first, please fill out our attendance form. There is a link in the question box. Without this, we do not have your email address and we will not be able to provide you with follow up after the webinar. A few more notes. At the end of the presentation, we will be taking questions. Please feel free to post your questions in the question and answer box. We may not be able to get to everyone's questions, but we will follow up with you afterwards. If something is not working, please type in the question box and we will have our technical support assist you. Please note this webinar is being recorded and a link to the to the recording will be sent out after the webinar. So before we begin, I'd like to say a few words about Credit Valley Conservation. Since 1954, Credit Valley Conservation has been responsible for protecting, managing, and restoring the natural resources of the Credit River watershed. Our watershed is located within the Golden Horseshoe, one of the most populated areas of Canada. You may have visited one of our conservation areas, attended an event, or took part in one of our tree plantings. We also monitor flood hazards, conduct permitting and regulations, and lead research and innovation to keep our environment healthy and climate change resilient. This work is made possible by the support of our partner municipalities who provide funding for the delivery of these programs and services. I would also like to formally acknowledge the land and water and the first people of this land. We acknowledge that the land on which we live and work and the entire Credit River watershed is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. The Credit River watershed is the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Métis, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. As citizens, we continue to be par party to the treaties made with Indigenous peoples, and we recognize their enduring presence on this land. We affirm that this land and water is our common source of life and we must all share in its care and prosperity. We hope this webinar will help you care for your land and water and prepare you for the challenges of the changes we are all facing together. Today, we have a panel of experts that will share with you their knowledge about the important issue of extreme heat and public health. Tim Kuntz is a specialist with our water resources section in hydrology and hydraulics. Kelsey McNeil is a specialist with our watershed monitoring group. And Kevin Bean is the deputy director of, our, of the Clean Air Partnership. We also have here today to help field your questions, Phil Bird, who is an aquatic specialist with our watershed monitoring group. And Josh Brooks is a program assistant with our rural outreach section. And he's going to be helping with moderating the question and answer box. Extreme heat is a period of high heat and high humidity. In extreme heat, your body works extra hard to maintain a normal temperature, which can lead to illness and even death. This webinar is quite timely as we've just experienced our first heat alert of the year. Extreme heat is of course a concern, but today we would also like to discuss the human health and environment impacts of rising temperatures in general and provide you with ways that you can protect your family, your property and your community. When you registered, we conducted a short three question survey. The first question we asked was whether you felt like our summers were getting hotter. The majority of people do feel that our summers are getting hotter. So we're definitely feeling the heat, but the only way to know if it's really heating up is to look at the data. So Tim Koontz again works with our real time monitoring group and is involved in, the, in collecting the data we use to monitor the weather and climate in the Credit River watershed. He can tell us a little bit more about the climate trends related to temperature and whether the temperature is actually really rising. Thank you, Allison, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to start by introducing our current climate monitoring at CVC. 
As part of our flood forecasting and warning program, we continuously monitor weather and river conditions throughout our watershed. So we monitor things like water levels, stream flow, as well as rain and several climate parameters, including air temperature. Now we monitor at many locations throughout our watershed, and most of this data is available in real time to the public, and that can be accessed by clicking on the link below here. Now many of these stations are relatively new. They're approximately seven to eight years old. However, to accurately detect trends in climate data, we need a longer term data record. So we've obtained that from two Environment and Climate Change Canada stations located in or very close to our watershed. So the first one is at Pearson Airport, and that data record goes back to the 1930s. The second is Orangeville, and that record goes back to the 1950s. So this data was evaluated as part of a trend analysis done by the Integrated Watershed Monitoring Program. Air temperature was chosen to be included in that analysis as it has a significant impact on many ecological functions. So very briefly, a statistical program was used to look at two components. First, we wanted to see if there was a change across the entire monitoring period. So did temperatures change from the start until the end? And second, if there was a change, what season showed the greatest amount of change? So before we look at the results, I'd like to briefly talk about the difference between climate monitoring and climate modeling. So in a very simplistic sense, monitoring is what's happening now. So we monitor current conditions. When people talk about climate modeling, usually what they're referring to are predictions or projections into what the future climate will look like. Now, of course, these two are related and we can use monitored data to improve and update climate models. So when we look at our air temperature trends in our watershed, overall we've seen a very clear warming pattern. Temperatures have increased year round in all seasons. However, we've seen the greatest increase in winter where we've seen an average temperature increase of about two and a half degrees Celsius throughout our watershed. Now, interestingly, our minimum temperatures, which generally occur at night, have increased more than our maximum temperatures, which generally occur during the day. Now, I'd also like to point out that the results from our analysis are very consistent with much wider trends that have been observed across Canada. Now, when we look at extreme heat specifically, so far, we have not found a statistically significant trend over the long term. However, within the past decade, we have some really interesting observations. So this graph shows the number of days where the maximum temperature exceeds 30 degrees Celsius. We also call these extreme heat days. According to our historical averages, we generally expect to see 12 extreme heat days per year. However, as you can see, since 2011, we've exceeded that in eight of nine years. 2014 was the only year we were below that line. And in four of those years, we've in fact doubled that mark. Now this is important as many climate change models do predict this type of extreme heat will increase in the future. Now, not only is extreme heat very problematic on its own, it can, it can also increase evaporation and water loss from our lakes, rivers, and soils, potentially drying them out. This could potentially exacerbate drought conditions if we experience prolonged periods with little rain. So the climate trends we've seen will no doubt have impacts on both our health and environment. Now I'd like to send it back to you, Allison. Yes, so I can definitely make the connection between hotter temperatures and drier conditions. And how will our wildlife and plant communities cope with these possible changes like drought? Well, Kelsey McNeil works with our ecological monitoring group and can tell us more about the potential impacts to our local ecosystems. Thank you, Allison, and good afternoon, everyone. 
So as Tim mentioned, one of the potential impacts we may see from a warmer, dry, warmer, drier climate is the potential for drought. Drought conditions can lead to drying of wetlands and streams and reduction in the amount of or water available in ground and surface water systems. Drying of wetlands can lead to reduction in habitat for wetland birds, such as American coot and pie-billed grebe, among many others, as well as amphibian species, such as frogs and salamanders. Drying of streams, in turn, can reduce habitat for fish and other aquatic organisms. Lack of water can place stress on plants, which have adapted to a specific range of moisture requirements. This range is small for some species and larger for others. Drought can push those conditions outside of those natural ranges, resulting in shifts in the plants that make up wetland communities. Depending on when drought conditions occur, it could have negative effects, not just on amphibian habitat, but also on their ability to reproduce. Frogs require water to lay their eggs in the spring. If drought conditions occur in the spring, it could reduce their ability to reproduce. And drought doesn't just have to affect wetlands and streams. It can also affect forest ecosystems. For instance, the redback salamander, which is a terrestrial salamander that lives in forests, lays its eggs on the moist forest floor and requires moisture to breathe through its skin. If conditions get too hot and dry, they may not have the moisture they require, not only for reproduction, but also to breathe. Another way that warming air temperature can affect our environment is through increasing water temperatures. Warming water temperatures can have serious impacts on fish. Every fish species has a lethal, lethal temperature thre threshold over which they cannot survive for extended periods. So while warmer stream temperatures may provide more suitable habitat for warm water species, the distribution of other species that require cooler temperatures, such as brook trout, will be limited. CBC's Integrated Watershed Monitoring Program has been monitoring streams within the watershed for the last 20 years. We monitor stream temperature, fish, benthic macroinvertebrates, water quality, and stream flow. Through this monitoring, we have detected warming in several of the watershed streams. For example, the absolute maximum water temperature, or the warmest that the water gets throughout the season, has increased over the last 20 years at four cold water sites. Also, the maximum weekly average temperature has increased at five sites. So we are seeing increases in water temperature at sites where cooler, um, where species require cooler temperatures. For example, brook trout require temperatures below 19 degrees. However, the sites that we saw the warming at, um, temperatures were up to 26 degrees and warming. However, there are a variety of factors that could contribute to these warming conditions. These other factors can place stress on our natural environment in addition to climate change. Urbanization places stress on natural communities and species in many ways. For example, the ur urban heat island effect, which is an urban area that is significantly warmer than its surrounding rural areas due to human activities, can exasperate warming temperatures from climate change. Similarly, development can lead to changes in the timing and extent of flooding in wetlands, which can therefore exasperate potential drought conditions. Uh, another factor is invasive species, which move into communities and outcompete native species. This can reduce the diversity of native, native species in our communities and reduce their, their resiliency, making it harder for these communities to adapt to other change. Activities that affect groundwater, such as drinking water systems and irrigation, can reduce groundwater levels. This in turn can affect the amount of groundwater contributing to streams. Since groundwater is cold, this reduction can lead to increases in stream water temperature. In addition, dams and online ponds can pool water, allowing it to warm in the sun, which again increases the water temperature in our streams. So this is an example of how confound these count confounding factors can affect our aquatic ecosystems. These graphs show water temperature data of a stream above and below a dam. So the light blue boxes are above the dam or upstream, and the dark blue boxes are below the dam, dam or downstream. The first panel here shows 
uh, water temperatures prior to dam restoration, where water temperatures downstream were significantly higher than those upstream. This led to water temperatures downstream of the dam that were approaching those that are unsuitable habitat for brook trout. After restoration, the stream temperatures are similar and brook trout were found downstream of the dam after the restoration took place. When you have all of these confounding, all of these factors that are already placing stress on watershed communities and species, the warming temperature from climate change places additional stress on them and can push them outside of their natural limits. So Alison, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you, Kelsey. So there's obviously many impacts to our plant and wildlife communities. We can also see that human activities are having a major influence. Many of these compounding factors I'm sure are also at work when we look at human health impacts. The second question we asked our webinar participants was whether or not they felt vulnerable or knew someone who might be vulnerable to hot days. Not everyone felt a sense of vulnerability. Kevin Bean, who's here from the Clean Air Partnership, has been working on these issues for a number of years. So Kevin, can you tell us more about the work that you do and the trends that we're seeing with regards to rising temperatures and human health and who is actually at risk? For sure. Thanks, Alison. And hello, everybody. Um, just let me know if you, you can't hear me clearly or can't see what I'm presenting. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about heat and human health. Um, there's a range of heat related illnesses that people experience uh, on hot days and especially on hot nights. And I think this is something Tim alluded to earlier when he noted that nighttime minimum temperatures are increasing at the, the greatest rate. This is really important. Um, the heat related illnesses we typically deal with are classic heat stroke. And this is really serious, especially if you are young or old, your body temperature is above 40 degrees Celsius, usually accompanied by headache, dizziness. Um, this is the sort of condition you've got to get to a hospital with. Exertional heat stroke, usually not in a vulnerable population, but for example, in people, uh, outdoor workers, we see this a lot in farmers, roofers, people participating in major sporting events. And then there's a range of other uh, heat related illnesses that are not quite as serious as stroke, but nonetheless uh, can result in, in presentations in, in doctors and uh, emergency rooms. So heat exhaustion, uh, fainting, heat edema or swelling, as well as rash and cramps. Um, regarding trends in heat-related illness, there's quite a lot of evidence out there internationally linking heat to morbidity and mortality or death and illness. Um, there's not as much evidence when we start to break it down and we get down into Canada, into Ontario, into our health units or our upper tier municipalities, our, our lower tier municipalities, the evidence keeps falling off. Um, so there's not a ton of Ontario specific evidence and another key thing to consider when we consider heat and especially mortality is if you die during an extreme heat event, the heat has put often has put people's uh, their respiratory systems, their, their hearts are working harder, their lungs are working harder. So people show up often with strokes or heart attacks. So those are not attributed to heat. Um, like to be blunt, the toe tag never says heat. Um, so what we have to do is epidemiological studies after the fact that can often be a year or two later that show this increased or excess uh, death during those heat events. So we don't generally have attribution uh, to heat of mortality and often of morbidity as well. Um, in Ontario, we have some evidence that shows that increased temperature has uh, significant increases in respiratory related deaths from Public Health Ontario, and we have limited amount of municipally specific information, um, for example, in Peel and in Toronto. Um, most this this curves the curves you're seeing here really hold well in the Canadian context. These are actually from the United States, and they're comparing on the eastern seaboard, basically uh, the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida, in the uh, dotted line compared to Boston, uh, Connecticut, in and other northern cities in the the straight line. And what you can see is this is a typical mortality curve, and it holds well for most northern climates, is that mortality is falling constantly as temperature rises from a low, we're dealing in Fahrenheit here, so pardon uh, pardon me for this, uh, from a low of minus 20, we see mortality drop, 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 until we get up to the sort of mid-60s, 
um, and then it starts to increase and in certain jurisdictions it can increase rapidly. So, so Canada would be, most Canadian municipalities would be in the more extreme areas of these curves where, where death really starts to kick off um, in the late 20s uh, Celsius. But I'll talk a little bit more about, about that uh, in a few slides. Um, so when we look at hospital re or heat related emergency room visits. This uh, slide is for, for Peel region from 2003 to 2016. When you see these numbers, they aren't overwhelming. They don't, you know, they don't scream alarmism uh, to me or they wouldn't create a great concern to me, but that's mainly because of how we code heat in these situations. Um, as I was explaining earlier, it's it's rarely attributed to heat specifically. So the numbers often <clears throat> don't really uh, alarm. When we consider the nature of vulnerability, human vulnerability to heat, there's exposure and there's sensitivity. Uh, exposure relating to people who perhaps work outside, one's uh, ability to get to a cool place. Do you have air conditioning? Do you live in a well-treed urban environment? And then there's personal sensitivity. So your, your demographics, your health, your income status, your social determinants of health generally, they lead to a potential vulnerability. Uh, when we add different adaptation layers to that vulnerability in terms of access to cool places, social connections, do you have someone coming to check in on you, this sort of stuff, we get a residual uh, vulnerability. Um, the factors that affect one's personal sensitivity, older adults, over 65s, uh, and in particular over 75s are, are quite vulnerable to heat, infants and young children. So again, the very old and the very young, they don't have the same ability to regulate their own body temperature as healthier midlife people do. Um, there's certain chronic illnesses, um, so respiratory, cardiac and psychiatric can leave you more prone to heat related illness. There are certain medications that have contraindications with heat that don't work as well um, when body temperature goes high. So, so they would be also uh, sensitive. And of course, those dependent on others uh, for assistance um, have a higher degree of sensitivity as well. And then there's the sort of personal exposure elements as opposed to the uh, spatial exposure elements. So those who work in heat, people who are homeless, precariously housed, low income, who have not got access to a cool place, especially at night. Um, and of course, the occupational exposure I, I spoke to earlier, um, both indoor and outdoor is, is worth considering as well. And the locational exposure, this is a, a, a Landsat 7 thermal image. So this is a satellite that goes across this region. Well, it's, it died actually a few years ago, but it, it used to go across this region every 16 days. And we can take the different snapshots from those satellites, uh, amalgamate them to give us a bit of a seasonal picture. And what it's quite useful in showing is the, the differences. I mean, you can see our river valleys there show up quite cool, our urban heat islands in our built up areas, especially the less well treed built up areas also show up quite cool. If you would a really keen eye, you'd notice that downtown right in the middle of the city of Toronto also shows up quite cool. And that's actually just because of the, the, um, the, the shadow effect of tall buildings in those areas. So we can layer all of these. We can use our, our, our geographic information systems to layer the spatial vulnerability together with the personal vulnerability and give us uh, a, a good snapshot of the overall heat vulnerability of any particular area. So Toronto Public Health uh, for the past decade has been um, doing this sort of mapping for the city of Toronto. Many other health units across Ontario do, do something similar. And this is really useful to inform health outreach during heat events to look at well, where are our hot spots, what can we do about it. So I'll talk a little bit more in a few minutes about the what we can do about it piece. Um, but before we get there, you know, just when we talk about heat and the number of hot days, uh, hot days meaning uh, greater than or equal to 30, um, in this particular region, we're looking at uh, approximately a doubling of those hot days in the period that we're currently in, 2021 to 2050. Uh, we're about to get into and a trebling of those hot days uh, from 2051 out to 2080. So again, while we, we look at the, the numbers and they don't raise huge alarm, we have to remember that we're not coding them correctly and they're about to change because our situation is changing, uh, is changing quickly.
So talking about what, what, what can you do about all of this? Um, there's a number of things we can do as individuals, and there's a number of things that our governments can help us do and our not profits and government partners can help us do as well. At a simple level, we can check in on vulnerable friends and neighbours. No more than we would during an ice storm, for example, or a heavy snowfall, we would ask uh, seniors, especially perhaps in our area, you know, can I help you? What do you need? Do you want me to go get some shopping for you? Whatever it is. Um, you can drink plenty of water before you feel thirsty. Um, and thirst is interesting because one can be dehydrated without feeling thirsty as well. You can plan your outdoor activities for earlier or later in the day. And then there's some very simple but very effective stuff. Wear loose fitting breathable clothing. Don't leave people or pets in cars. Cool showers or swim if you're able to. Maybe not cook hot meals on particularly hot days to uh, add to the temperature of your home and close curtains and blinds. And you know when we think about the temperature of our homes, in the major heat events uh, in, in Europe um, in the, the middle of the last decade, where you know in France alone we saw 70,000 people uh, dying in one year alone, we found those people were dying for, for quite a period of time after the heat had ended. And that's because you know our homes are often made of materials like brick. Uh, if you put a brick in the oven and then you turn off the oven, the brick will still emanate heat for a couple of days after the oven goes off. So that's what we're trying to uh, There's a range of other things we can think about in terms of building materials and so on, but we're not really there yet in terms of design, how we consider how we actually build. Um, and then talking about what our governments and government partners can do, they have a huge role in alerting and education in syndromic surveillance. So after SARS, of course, timely discussion these days, when SARS hit Ontario, um, syndromic surveillance systems were created that allow us to, in real time, look at admissions into our hospitals, look at clusters in different areas, um, and then you know have an outreach strategy that can respond to that. So we can do that for heat as well, and we do do that for heat. There's vulnerability mapping, which I'd spoken to already. Um, we use cooling centers. Um, this is often when a, a, an extended heat warning uh, is issued, and I'll talk in a second about what that is. Um, <clears throat> we open cool places where people can go, but that's only if they can get there, right? Like sometimes our most vulnerable people are less likely to travel to a cooling center, so it doesn't solve all of our problems. There is the potential for maximum temperature regulation in um, social housing buildings. We currently have minimum temperature regulation, like the buildings must be kept at a set temperature from, I don't know what the dates are exactly, but something along the lines of November 1st to April 1st. The next point, uh, looking at HVAC systems, so how we um, heat and air and cool these buildings. Often, if you get an early season heat event uh, in a social housing building, for example, the heating system is still on, yet there is a heat event happening. So these systems are not nimble. It takes it's quite a process to turn them over. So let's look at those systems, for example. Um, there's outreach that's often done in conjunction with groups like Salvation Army, Red Cross and so on to our shelters, our parks, our boarding houses, places of vulnerability we know that exist. We can also look at extending um, pool hours as well. And I'll just talk uh, before I sign off on um, the harmonized heat warning information system for Ontario. So before 2016, Ontario was a mishmash of heat alerts, heat warnings, different terms we used with different criteria to call them all over the place. Um, you know, especially in the south where we are, you've got people who might live in Peel, work in Toronto. They may get media from one and not in the other. So we've got all these terms bandying around and people were just not taking it seriously because the messaging was, was too mixed. So all 36 health units in Ontario together with Environment and Climate Change Canada, Public Health Ontario, ourselves at Clean Air Partnership and a range of other uh, partners, Health Canada as well, um, got together to create a single system for the province. And this is it. There's basically three regions in Ontario we've defined, and this is all based on meteorology and epidemiology. So it's all science based and based on the best risk communications knowledge we have. Um, so you'll see in our region here in southern Ontario, a heat warning is called where we have two days projected of a maximum temperature above 31 and a minimum temperature equal to 
or greater than 20 or a humid X equal or greater than 40. So those minimum temperatures, those are the nighttime minimum temperatures that are so important for people to, to cool down in. Um, and then obviously we tweaked that a little bit for the north um, due to personal sensitivity characteristics primarily, and also for the Windsor area for the same reason, but going in the other direction, given that is the hottest region of the country. Um, and just some of the other issues to consider when we talk about heat. Um, again, when I, when, I, when I refer back to the Peel slide I had with the, the numbers of ER admissions, well, what we don't really take into account are all of these other areas where heat affects human health in terms of air quality, uh, skin cancers from ultraviolet light, uh, vector-borne and zoonotic diseases, food security, and of course, um, water quality as well, which we're going to speak to in, in future webinars. Um, I've just left my information there, so uh, if anyone has any detailed questions, you are welcome to, uh, to send those through to me. Thank you. So thank you, Kevin. Obviously, Obviously there are a number of serious impacts related to rising temperatures and extreme heat associated with climate change. And you mentioned a number of ways that people can reduce their exposure to heat. We've surveyed our webinar participants to find out what people are doing to protect themselves from heat exposure. And of course, these are very important actions people can take to reduce their risk. One important factor is having access to a cool space to get out of the heat. Many of us are turning up the air conditioning inside as temperatures go up outside. However, this can create a positive feedback effect by increasing our energy use. Our need for cooler spaces is going to increase, but there are also ways for us to keep our homes and our properties cooler using natural means which can help reduce the need for air conditioning. So I'm going to speak to you about some of the additional actions that you can be taking. So I'm sure that you've all heard this before, but tree cover is our natural cooling solution. Trees have so many benefits, both in reducing greenhouse gases, but also in cleaning both our air and water. They also help to provide shade and maintain the natural cycle of water on the land. Native trees provide important habitat for wildlife, and increase the overall resiliency of our natural communities to climate change. With so many benefits, it's hard to see why everyone who has the space available isn't already planting a tree. We already have many landowners who are tree planting, whether it's one or two trees or planting a forest for the future. Every tree counts. And there are trees here in the background there. They're quite small, but this is entire, that entire field is has both planted with 13,000 trees. You can maximize the benefits of trees by planting more strategically. To the left is an example of a landowner who's still looking to retain some open space, but planted along the stream and pond on the property. This is going to provide habitat, buffer the water sources from pollution, and provide the important function of keeping water temperatures cool. You can also plant trees around your home. And this is going to help provide shade and cool your home in order to reduce the use of air conditioning. And building on and connecting between natural areas can also help to, prove, to improve overall ecosystem resilience. Another concern with increased temperatures and prolonged periods between rainfall events is of course the potential reduction in water availability. Wildlife are dependent on our natural water sources. You can prevent water quantity issues by protecting and enhancing natural water sources on your property. For example, one impact of the invasive species Phragmites is that it has a higher transpiration rate than native vegetation and it can dry out wetlands. So that's one more good reason to be removing invasive species on your property. It's also important to conserve water inside and out. Reduce water consumption wherever possible. Use more efficient fixtures and fix leaky ones. And this is also going to prolong the life of your septic system. Capture water and slow it down in urban areas by reducing hard surfaces and by installing rain barrels in rain gardens. Some of these projects may sound like a lot of work. So how do you equip yourself with the knowledge you need to take action and protect your property and your community? Well, you could go on the internet and do a Google search, but if you want information that is based on local scientific data, the Conservation Authority can provide this information. 
your local conservation authority works with and is supported by your municipality and has scientists, engineers, and ecologists that are available to you for knowledge and advice. We have many services for landowners, including workshops, print and web resources, free site visits and incentives, and funding support for many projects. We also have many in-house services for implementing projects like tree planting, and in other cases, we can provide technical support as you work with contractors to complete your project. For more information, you can contact us at stewardship at cbc.ca. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. We will now take some time to answer everyone's questions. So I'm just going to see if we have any questions here currently. So we do have a question here with regards to city planning and looking to divert rainwater from sewers, rooftops, and roadways and keep it for, for, for future use. So I think that's, um, that is an interesting question. Um, there are various techniques um, that can, again, divert rainwater. Um, so one, again, that I mentioned in my presentation was um, installing a, something like a rain barrel. So that is going to take water from your rooftop and that can be collected and then used for uh, watering your uh, garden and your lawn. And then also, um, I think uh, things like um, our rain gardens, um, so again, taking the water again from the rooftop that can be directed into a rain garden or a soak away pit, and that is going to allow that water to drain slowly into the ground instead of it um, going into our storm sewer. So our next question is, do you expect medical incidents related to heat to increase this year with the closing of cooling centers and pools and reduce capacity in natural areas? What are some possible solutions? What do we need to address to build greater resiliency for vulnerable populations in the future? So I think there's a number of different uh, questions there. So with regards to medical incidents, um, I'm just going to direct that to you, Kevin. Um, I would probably say yes. <laughs> yeah. It, it's actually hard to tell because we don't have great evidence on the effectiveness of cooling centers or of pools. Um, I mean, cooling centers often, there, there's very few people attend them. And I guess this speaks to the, the greater issue of communication around extreme heat. Um, for our most vulnerable populations, for our over 75s, I don't think it would be reasonable to expect them to leave their house, use transit, get to a cooling centre just to get indoors into a cool place when they would have to have left their home, dealt with travel, transportation and so on. Um, also, you know, how, how do we actually communicate to them to start with that they're indeed is is a heat alert and, and a heat problem and that there's something can be done about it so it's a, it's a complex communications uh, issue the same would go for marginally housed and and homeless people um so i i would be reluctant to say there would be a huge spike in uh morbidity or mortality this year because those are not open um cool or sorry public health units across the province are currently grappling with exactly what to do in these situations what should they advise their municipalities to do for uh, these populations um and also we don't know what sort of summer we're going to get right like if we have a one day event we wouldn't expect a huge uh uptick in uh, illness because of that where we get multi-day events um, that's when we really see problems without any respite from heat so again it, it sort of speaks to the lack of, of data we have here generally but even in the event of a uh, of a long-term um, heat event it's hard to know really what the uh, morbidity and mortality effect will be this year. Uh, we'd really have to look at that a few years later and also consider the fact that our most vulnerable often stay in place during these events regardless. So 
OK, so our next question is. What are other invasive species that we should be on be on the lookout for? And um, I'm not sure if that's just specifically with regards to having impacts on hydrology. Um, but I'm going to turn this over perhaps to Kelsey or to Phil, um, who might have um, some experience with um, some of those ecological impacts. Hi, sure. Um, I can speak to plants. Um, so again, I'm not, as Allison said, clear if we're talking about how hydrologic impacts or just invasive species in general. Um, some of the um, invasive plants that we are um, that we really want to keep an eye out that for are things like garlic mustard, um, uh, common buckthorn. Uh, there's a giant hogweed. I know CDC also has a list on their website um, of uh, priority invasive species. Um, also uh, along rivers as well. Um, as Phragmites is Miscanthes um, and um, oh, I can't think of the word. Japanese knotweed as well. Um, so those are some of the um, invasive vegetation species that are of high priority in the area and dog strangling fine as well. Um, Phil, do you have anything aquatic wise? Yeah, so the some of the things that make aquatic fish species and other uh, aquatic invasives invasive is the fact that they have such a broad temperature tolerance. So species like round goby or um, common carp or the Asian carps that are kind of at the doorstep of the Great Lakes all have pretty wide temperature tolerance. Uh, we've seen round goby introductions in the Great Lakes and in the Credit River watershed and uh, they have a much much higher temperature tolerance so mid 20s if the water temperature is uh, that warm uh, they're more than happy to uh, survive in in that extreme heat uh, they can survive in low dissolved oxygen whereas our native cold water species would be reduced and would have to find refuge elsewhere okay thank you phil so we have another question with regards to um, infectious disease so I think this uh, also relates to um, the discussion related to cooling centers. Uh, the question was um, again with things like COVID-19 strategies like cooling centers will become problematic. So I'm not sure if Kevin if you have any further comments in that area. Um, yeah, I would just add that it's it's not just cooling centres. I mean, what about our libraries? Many people go to the libraries just uh, for a cool place. Many people might go to, if we considered our, our, our private places of cooling, what about your, your local coffee places and so on? There's a huge range of places people go to keep cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, from from that perspective, it, it, it is a worry and it is a it, it's a consideration that really has only in the past couple of weeks really have health units been able to to try and grapple with. Um, you know, in Ontario, our public health units are drastically underfunded at the best of times. Uh, they've had to reallocate staff from areas where they work in all sorts of areas, not just infectious disease, to work on the COVID response. So an already stripped down, um, you know, public uh, group that we need so badly is now being stretched further than probably they ever have been before. So they are trying to grapple with these questions, but I don't know how how far we've come yet to responding to them. But yeah, it's a, absolutely a worthy um, consideration for sure. Yes, I think it's definitely something that um, emergency managers uh, related even just to other emergencies uh, need to be grappling with as well as the, the public health units. And the next question is related to um, the documentation of heat. So um, the question is, what needs to be happen what, what needs to happen to have heat better documented as a cause or at least a factor in deaths and or illnesses? So the way we currently 
I'm not, no, I'm not a public health specialist. So it, my understanding of it is the way we currently code illness is problematic. Um, you know, basically we use a numerical type system and uh, everything gets catalogued as such. I don't actually have the answer. I mean, I, I, I don't know how we respond to this uh, immediately. Like so, someone shows up at, at an emergency room with a heart condition on a hot day. I'm not sure what the process could be to relate that to heat uh, as opposed to any other underlying condition. Um, you know, I know that public groups like Public Health Ontario that work with the data, um, there's they've done good work to do epidemiological studies after the fact when the heat events have passed. But in the short term, um, I don't know. It's a good question. And I wish I had a, a Helen Doyle or another public health specialist on the line who would actually be able to respond to it. OK, well, I think um, that is a, a fairly um, good response, though, um, given that that's not your specific um, area of expertise. I think that that does provide us with some information. And um, I, yeah, I think that's maybe something that needs to be looked at and addressed. Um, so we have a, another question, which is just related to um, making a green recovery from COVID and um, and I guess uh, the, the importance of connecting with our political leaders um, in order to, um, I think, make sure that uh, there's an understanding of, of, of the importance of sustainability as we um, move forward in, in recovery. Um, so I'm, but the question is about actually uh, working with other environmental groups um to do this and i think um certainly our organization um is is an advocate for um taking sustainable action so um and we we do have um our connections with our municipal leaders so i think that's something that um as we work with our municipal partners that um that is uh important and certainly I think is being communicated through um, that avenue. So we have another question here, um, just related, I think, I mean, I don't know if any of us can really answer this, um, perhaps this is more of a comment, but uh, has there been any consideration or discussion of the ethical implications of the time of day hydro rates with higher rates at the time of day when AC is most needed? Uh, this can cause some of the most vulnerable to not use AC during the day. Um, versus the obvious potential higher use of hydro um, and less conservation with lower costs. Keeping in mind that those who are well off and can afford the costs, higher cost does not necessarily affect their behavior. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure again if, if we could directly answer the, that question, but I think it's um, something that is important to reflect on, um, especially I think there's with regards to the most vulnerable populations, that there is a social justice element um, to many of these issues um, that really needs to be thought about um, as we look at strategies to um, try to make our communities more resilient to climate change. And we are at one o'clock now, so I think we're going to wrap up. But again, if we didn't get to your question, um, we can follow up with you after the webinar. So I just want to thank everyone for attending and thank again all of our presenters. You can also contact us if you do have any further questions or need more information again at stewardship at cbc.ca and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.